Greetings, everybody. It's Jim. It's nice to see you all again. Took a few weeks off to make sure that I got to enjoy the beautiful weather that is out here in the great state of Washington. Uh, just beautiful weather out here. And, you know, as they say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming. But when Game of Thrones says it, it's meant to be a warning. I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. We just state it as a fact of life, okay? Nothing but snowfall, tons of it all around. And even though I'm transplanted here all the way across the country, and we only get three weeks of the white stuff, if at all, uh, I just know that it's just my instinct to get out there while I can. Now, mind you, you know, I still stay inside a lot. It's just my natural habitat, right? But I did get out a little bit more. Still got some of my gaming in, and I hope you did too. But today, I did not just come empty-handed to you. Today, as you can see, I've got my trusty, dusty stuff, Fantasy Trip shirt on. So you know I'm talking about gaming goodness, and my gift is Fantasy Trip related. I have, um, you know, it was, uh, it, what, what it is, is I come bearing gifts of adventure. Uh, it is something that, as you can see here, see over here, this is my brother's artwork. Uh, this is the interior art page one for the book that I'm about to show you, which you can download for free right now. It is a hundred page programmed adventure. A lot to talk about and unpack about why it's being given for free. What's it about? All that, and you could download it right now while you're listening to this. Shouldn't take too long. Go to the link below. But today, I'm bearing gifts for you about why you should be using Sorcerers at Smokewater, a programmed ensemble adventure for the fantasy trip by yours truly. So about the adventure, uh, basically it's made for four 32-point characters, and more specifically, not just newer characters, but actually newer players uh, in newer groups. Not that veterans can't play it. I've had all my playtesters were veterans, and they definitely enjoyed it. But this is really great for um, newer players, and I'll tell you why. Uh, mainly because, of course, they got 32-point characters to begin with, and it's harder to hit with those characters, where a lot of people would rather let them play 36-point characters so they can feel like they're doing something. Uh, this adds a lot of tension, and because I promote the idea that characters can come in and out during play, these players don't have to worry about having one character that they're putting all their energy in and worrying about if they survive or not and holding up Thing, their decision making process and as the game master you could just let the dice roll where they lay where they may as well um you can actually be rather brutal and not worry about it because they're not going to be worried about it because they're already at the beginning of the game going to be playing multiple npcs uh before they even get to the main pcs that they've created and you know when player when these People get hit, which they will, and and they're not going up against anything terrible. They're generally thirty-two point characters as well for the most. Part. Um, when they go up against a first challenge for a thirty-two character, um, but at the same time they'll get hit. They'll they'll probably hopefully run away, and you can encourage that. By the way, um, well to to some degree, there are some points where okay, you don't want them to lose the adventure and stuff, or not lose the adventure, but lose this section it can't go back but there's nothing wrong with a retreat and then saying in some se sections and saying okay um this guy got hit he's gonna have to heal naturally which is a great thing to do with them and because you know there are no healing spells and potions are expensive to come by so they just make a new character up keep that one on the back burner for a few weeks until they heal then they can bring them back you continue on, and then you bring it back as a cameo later or whatever, or just another replacement, whatever you want to do. I would suggest if anybody's out of the of the game, they're out of the adventure. Keep them out of the adventure, keep that character alive, and allow them to bring them back in later, okay? Um, you know, after, after the adventure's over, and just say, okay, here's our myriad of characters that we all get to play. And that way, your, your players will have, like, maybe three or four characters each. Um, you know, depending on how bad their dice roll, I guess. But maybe they'll have more than one. Uh, I'm also very happy for the epilogues at the end. Um, the epilogues are something that I just kind of did. Uh, I said, okay, let's continue the story here. But instead of just coming up with um, just some, some adventure hooks, which is fine, I make them actually more, um, more programmed adventure. Um, you know, more choices to made for just about each one of them i think some of them just have a paragraph in the as a loose end 
of that you can tie up if you but most of them actually have more choices that the players can go through and say okay this is what happens do you want to continue this idea and that'll be up to you and the player if they want to and i also like it because there are a lot of easter eggs for steve jackson games back uh so pretty much a nice little cool factor i really had a lot of uh, fun tying in certain things let's see if you can spot them uh so definitely i uh, i hope i uh, hope if you are a fan of steve jackson games for any length of time that you can enjoy the epilogues as well all right now i'd be remiss talking about the fantasy trip if i didn't mention that there's only four days left in hexagram 10's kickstarter um that's going on right now though now they're just under nineteen thousand. Uh, right now, and it's very feasible that they'll hit 25,000 by the end. Why is that important? Because then everybody that's in the 24 uh, pledge level and up will receive Quick Quest number eight, uh, written by Howard Kistler. Okay, so that one is actually quite good. I hope that we can get it. Now, there doesn't mean you have to, you know, break the bank to get this stuff. For as little as a $40 pledge, you're going to get the following. And you can get Texagram 10 just for $7.95, and that'd be good enough. Fine, not a problem. Uh, we all know the, the value that you get of them. Uh, but the Hexagram Vault you can also get, and it's a nice little box, actually, from the look of it here. Let's just, let's just go take a look. This is the inside of the box just to house all 10 issues that you have of, of the Hexagrams, if you've been getting them all since square day one. Uh, as I have. And the thing is, normally I don't like things in boxes. I want to get them out. Re accessibility means playability, right? However, I can understand with the hexagrams because they're fat on one side and skinny on the other. Uh, they do definitely take up a lot more space than I'd like in my shelves, unless you want to alternate them and then it's just weird. Um, this just puts them away kind of nicely. Plus, I mean, the box here looks kind of nice, and they're doing something with it. Like, it's another utility that they've done with all their box covers. Um, this one's about loot. You put, you roll some dice in there, you shake a, shake a, shake a, and, you know, depending on how it lands on the silver or their gold, it just it randomly generates how much you get, you know, what this creature has or whatever. Uh, kind of cool. Would you use it? Eh, maybe. It depends on your, your play style. I just like the fact that they're trying to make some utility out of everything. Use every square inch. Um, you get that when you see Steve Jackson games. I mean, they're not going to just put blank spots for counters. They'll put one on there. I'm still waiting for Steve Jackson as the giant uh, in bell-bottom pants. I just... <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna keep talking about it until I get it. I'll make one. I'll have my brother draw one up. That's what I'll do. I'll just go all um guerrilla warfare on the project. <laughs> and I'll never write for Steve. <laughs> That's all right, okay. But anyway, uh, we got this book right here. I mean this box right here, but there is another book. And it's written none other by uh, David Pulver, and it is the Trail School of Martial Magic, and boy, how did it's going to be a nice little source book. I asked about it, saying, was it going to be, a, there are going to be some more spells in it. Of course, that's the first thing you think of. You know, I was kind of like, oh, I know they're kind of against making more spells and skills in the game. They're really taking a very careful approach because they, you know, they want it balanced. They don't want to turn it into this thing where it's so big that, you know, it's like, look, you want something new, tweak it yourself. Right now, everything's fine and balanced. We don't want to rock the boat, and I can understand that, absolutely. Um, but the Trail School of Magic does have a few spells in it, but, uh, and I asked this on the Kickstarter, and David actually definitely does something to wet your whistle. Go read it in the comments section, how he's talking about all the different factions and how they interact with each other. There is just so much, uh, you know, here. And what I really like is he talks about anti mechan mechan mechanics guild. All right, uh, basically, or the anti, you know, anti mechanics, uh, yeah, guild for uh, you know wizards and stuff because wizards don't like uh, technology, you know, because it threatens them um, in in so many ways, and maybe even society. Maybe society fell because of technology. Lo and behold, where are we at now, right? Um, but basically, uh, it's really interesting stuff. It's written by David Pulver. You're not going wrong. $40, you're going to get all three of those items and hopefully a quick quest as well. I think they're going to make 25 
And just as a reminder, folks, if you've come this far in the video, there's a good chance you've liked the video. I hope so, anyway. Please take a moment to smash that like and subscribe button and just let me know I'm doing a good job. I do appreciate it. All right, so let's go over what the adventure's all about. Now, go, go figure, lo and behold, the last take I did, I went through 20 minutes of the whole thing and I forgot to put the microphone. <laughs> figure uh but hey maybe i got some practice in right um but anyway it all started when i got the legacy edition of the fantasy trip you know i finally took the plunge um you know as you might have known i loved melee but i never played wizard or in the fan in the labyrinth at all you know i only played melee and i know i loved it and i know it turned into the groups in some way shape or form and i i definitely respect that but it was always pegging me should i get these little boxes, uh, melee, and just play it, and then wizard. I know I'm gonna want that. And of course, I remember Death Test. I always wanted to get it, but didn't. But at that point, that was 45 bucks. The Legacy Edition was yeah, probably twice as much. But I'd get those three things too. And you look at all the stuff you get in the the, the Legacy Edition. So it kept on pinging me. You know, I'd see it at Gen Con, pinging me, and I looked like a great production. It was pinging me, and then finally I dive, dived in. And the next thing you know, it arrives on my doorstep. I crack it open. I'm hooked. I'm like, the whole thing's beautiful. Are you kidding me? And this was made 25 years ago? Jeez. Why didn't I play this book? So anyway, lo and behold, next thing you know, I'm writing an adventure for it. Now, I've always wanted to write an adventure from start to finish. Now, I'm all kinds of mode. Easy. Um, but the thing is, writing it wasn't so easy at first because the thing is, the three wizards, as the working title was at first, just something simple, um, it was an open-ended adventure. It was never a programmed adventure to begin with, and it was good, um, but it was still it was hard to write at first because of the idea that it had to be open-ended. I was so used to the last few decades being semi-linear adventures, right, uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, and just used to that in my mindset. That I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I gotta broaden what these guys are like and what they do i can't account for them being here or there they could be here they could be there it depends on where they go well how do i guide them kind of to where they want to go or where i want them to go right and so that became a thing and even though i finished the entire sections of this area this area and this labyrinth over here um you know i'm like oh i'm still kind of up in the air then it came to me like you know and I, I mean, I could write the programmed adventures like they used to have. And they were calling for programmed adventures. Yeah, because I kind of have a little bit of experience playing around with that, of course, uh, being a Zork fan in the 80s, stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, I could probably do that. And it's I'm very logical based. So I was very motivated to give it a shot. Now, the thing is, that still doesn't mean that I did things the easy way. I definitely did this the hard way. And I, you know, I didn't have any of David Pulver's stuff in my hands at the time um, and seeing how he sectioned off things. And what I mean by that is uh, his thing, his writings like Dragon Hunt, all of his adventures really um, work in sections. You could see that he's here, like um, some oasis over here is section 100. Then, uh, and this is before you jumble up the numbers, right? So section 100 to 110 is this section or up to 109, I should say. 110 to 119 might be the force of yada yada um 120 to 129 is this etc etc now mind you if it goes over nine paragraphs you got to put them somewhere but for the most part you know where they start so when you got to go back through and go to a section check mapping or whatever it's very easy as opposed to what i did was like i was trying to find out of course these three areas now i had to make another section of how they got there who hired them to go there um and it ended up being all over the place um it was still sectioned off to a degree but because things got so big because i didn't know where to stop you know um he definitely has places to stop and, and what i didn't do though was um you know i went all bandersnatch on thing. and if you don't know what i mean by bandersnatch there's a great series called dark uh, mirror uh great science fiction series uh, from the uk on netflix and there's a episode called bander statue was special and it's all about this guy in the 80s trying to write this programmed adventure just like zork and stuff but so many choices and it went so far down the the line that it was just absolutely insanity 
um, of all the possible options. Now, I didn't go that crazy on these things, but I definitely learned that, man, there's a lot that you can go on. And every time I came up with a decent idea, I wanted to put it in. And so, therefore, I kind of did. Um, but what ended up happening, uh, purely by accident, that this whole adventure kind of works as like a big Plinko adventure machine where you've got um, characters popping in and out. And I did that, um, that wasn't exactly by accident. That was actually by design because I think it gives it a cinematic feel. Um, you know, you have an intro and then it kind of sets the stage and you can see it go, dun, 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 you know, and it goes, I have a section that's called Fade the Black. When you see that, that's the idea of the director in your mind fading everything the black. We move over and go to a new scene. It opens up. There's new characters there. It's not the same character, okay? So that, right from the beginning, you know, you're playing two characters, uh, Dargon and Tanoth, and they get involved in some kind of hijinks and such, and then it goes to the ma main characters for a little bit, then it bounces back and forth between other characters before you see the four main characters show up at the smoke water, and then things really get heated up and going. And um, but basically, anything can happen with those uh, few uh, encounters that happen beforehand that can change the scope of what's happening as the main adventure goes forward. Or I should say, this is the part of the main adventure, but as the PCs really get involved, um, you know, so other things can happen. It's kind of like a lot of the games, the micro gaming um, series that I've done. You know, so a lot of games have uh, randomizers, you know, instead of saying, okay, this is the setup for the game, which actually can make the games drier and non-replayable. Um, you know, because you'll say, okay, here's the setup. Here's what we do all the time. We move our forces here. It's like you're playing the first few turns by rote, you know. Uh, there are little randomizers that they have set game the game up differently. And this kind of does this in an RP form, okay. Uh, so you can play the game multiple times and get a different result. Um, and it's more than just the beginning. It happens all around the thing. Okay, it just turned into a thing. I said, this is a good idea. I like where this is going. It's hell to write, let me tell you. I'd rather do it the David Pulver way, which I end up doing with my second adventure, um, um, Awakening the Ogre, which is also going to be for free uh, in, in the upcoming weeks. So enjoy that one. But I definitely had an easier time writing Awakening Awakening the Ogre using David Pulver's format that I did this. I'm very proud of what I've done. It's very unique, I believe. Uh, but actually trying to replicate it and doing it with another adventure is a lot of work. And I mean, I, I love the payoff of it, but at the same time, it's like, well, I could write for maybe two or three adventures uh, by writing that one. And I don't know. I, I mean, I'm kind of torn with whether I'd want to do, do uh, another one like that again but i mean i definitely like the way it turned out um now the, i should talk about a little bit about why steve jackson uh did not take the adventures um mainly i'm not feeling bad about it because out of the the play testers i've got i had 10 guys definitely know their stuff um and one of the guys is peter von klesman which is the tft line editor right now and he liked it enough, so I'm feeling pretty good that the game that they were pretty well done. Um, but what was the thing that Steve uh, didn't want in them? Why didn't he? Couldn't he print them out? Well, when it comes to the three wizards, or I should say, sorcerers at Smokewater, it was just too big. And because I didn't have it sectioned off layout with so many plot words around, it was going to be an editing nightmare. Okay, now I've already gotten it edited. Peter von Klesman actually went through it a lot. Um, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, they have to go through it, you know, again and again, and they only have so much staff, um, you know, and it's like, okay, it's a hundred pages long. It's kind of big, you know, I mean, how are we going to make this happen? Um, there was just a lot of question marks on that. So that was one of the reasons that went, uh, down like that. Now, Awakening the Ogre is a little bit different because I follow David Polar's format. It's a lot easier to go through. Quite honestly, I think I had an easier time getting that one done than uh, than this one. But what happened there? Well, with Awakening the Ogre, I kind of do something that actually, I don't want to give anything away on it because the whole idea is this idea is kind of really super cool. Um, and unfortunately, 
he kind of changes some aspects of the thing and he doesn't want to go down this rabbit hole um you know as far as rule changes or what is it and, and ends up being official content uh and it would definitely change the aspects of that that's more for something the game masters on their own and i can understand it now the thing is again that adventure is written very sectional like a david pulver thing i could actually take that section out as as much as it pertinent to the story as it seems i could take that section out of it replace it with another thing explain away this that or the other thing and keep everything intact uh, and replace it but i just i feel like no nothing would be as cool as what i wrote <laughs> not you know it'd be all right but it wouldn't be as cool and i i i you know, I can write another adventure. At this point, I have all the confidence in the world that I can. Uh, with all the playtesters that helped me out, they enjoyed the playtesters. I still got them and say, hey, have you, you know, can I play this is, uh, with my friends now? You know, I mean, I want to say now they can um, because, you know, it's not, it's not going to be an official Steve Jackson product. And I'm letting it out loose on the, on the street, which I've talked to him about already, by the way. He says, yeah, there's nothing stopping you, um, which is great. Um, definitely enjoy both of these um but yeah i i really think that you'll enjoy awakening the ogre too uh it's just um easier format to write and i i highly suggest if anybody's actually thinking about doing a program to venture they follow that format it's just a lot easier or at least death tests in that way um you know that would be another one that would follow that kind of uh format uh, what I've done here with the whole Plinko machine and going back and forth and having everything affect everything else, um, it wouldn't be so bad if it was completely linear. Having this affect this and then affect this, then it wouldn't be so hard. Maybe I should explain that. But it's not like it's linear because it's not. The players, when they get here, they can start here. Uh, there, there are places where they're going to have to go. There are, there are van not vantage points, but there are critical key points where they... Are definitely going to want to have to hit but they can hit them in any order so in a way i wanted to keep it as an open-ended adventure to a degree and maybe that was just my mistake of making it more complicated than it needed to be you know, i could say let's just do it in order yeah things affect other things down the road but you're still going to do them in this order eh i don't know i guess maybe but it's done now <laughs> So it's the the damage is done. Okay, for sorcerers at Smokewater, you also get two more books in addition to the hundred page of material that they that, that you get. Um, one of them is the map diagram book, which is a perfect example of how I actually went uh, a little bit doing things the hard way the first time around because uh, when I was playing it, I wasn't if I would play only played death test ahead of time. I didn't play it until much later than making this adventure um, because, you know, I'm using the mega hexes and I'm creating all the maps with it, which is kind of fun anyway. I don't regret doing it. It's just as far as the programmed adventure and making it, uh, I love Death Test's uh, simplistic and efficient way of just using the melee map, doing a few changes, and now you got a new map for every battle in that game. So, but this has a, a diagram book, big and small little configurations here and there and that's fine but in awakening the ogre i wise up and i put everything on the wizard map. so awakening the ogre will make things a little bit easier but for sorcerers at smoke water get ready to break break out your mega hexes because you're going to be using them uh you're also going to get a cast of characters book so every pc npc in the game they're all on cards here um, so you can use them, and I also do that with all the monsters anyway, just in case you like using cards, and, you know, maybe putting them in an order of dexterity for purposes, what have you, uh, even though the stats are available in the main book. So as we're talking, you probably already are leafing through that as I'm speaking to you right now, and I'm pretty happy about how the layout turned out. I did it in a pretty short amount of time, actually. Actually, I've been working on a lot of the formatting as I was waiting for so I got it all done, and then just last final tweaks, putting the pages on, and uh, put it, making sure one of the biggest things is actually making sure that there's no orphan um, on the on the top of every column, which means like at, at the paragraph, especially with a programmed adventure, um, you know, having a paragraph and then maybe having only two lines on the upper part of the next column, especially if that column goes to another page that you got to flip. 
I'd rather not have that. So I made sure if there's anything like that, especially at the bottom of a page, that they just go right, the whole section just goes right on over. Um, and for the most part, uh, there are a few little white spots there, you know, but for the most part, if there's any big spots, I've got pictures in there that are appropriate or, you know, next to, uh, you know, next to the section about, you know, the theme of your, like you're talking to a bartender, the bartender, like with a goblin, goblin, etc., etc. And I, I think we're, uh, you know, I'm using Adobe InDesign for the latter part of, uh, a decade now so unlike creating the adventure um i didn't have to do things the hard way <laughs> i mean adobe InDesign really makes it easier while well, if i was still using word well, word makes it easy too but i mean InDesign for the layout and stuff like i let you you know make certain headers and it, there's a consistency but let me just say it makes making things pretty easy uh pretty easier um, and of course, I've got all the nice artwork to work with. I got Rick Hershey, um, Jason Walton, Spencer, one of my new favorites out there. And of course, my favorite of all time, which is Christopher Isert. And, you know, I, there's something about me that really wanted to make that not interior art and just go with the cover on that because just look at how beautiful that is. Um, but I, you know, having him colorize that, I feel like that would just be because he works so good in black and white. When he gets to this level of detail, okay. Now, you know, he has that, he has it down. When he was younger, he'd have so much detail, it wouldn't flow. I mean, it would be beautiful. But you'd really stare at it, you know. Here you can capture the whole flow of whatever's going on and still appreciate all the crazy detail. It's absolutely insane. And I would almost think that putting it in color would take away from it. Not that he can't work in color. As a matter of fact, um... Now that he worked with Steve Jackson Games on the Bestiary, once that job was complete, he's been working on another job uh, uh, right now for Columbia Games, and he's doing the uh, he's doing the cards for a game called Pigskin, um, and that is a, an adaption that I made to their game uh, Slapshot. All right, which is a hockey. Uh, this one, and you don't have to enjoy hockey like you don't have to really. Uh, enjoy football to enjoy this game it's more like team management and actually making trades with people and player observation uh there is a video i have on slapshot on that. and the, the 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 variation that i made is basically just to give it a football feel and of course the the cards are usually comedic uh you know they are comedic actually and so chris decided okay uh, he's going to go with a 1950 rockabilly uh, style for all the cards in the game and he's he's colored these just fine and that's mr meaner right there uh you know it's pretty pretty cool and he's got all these over the top ideas that he's taken off with uh with um all the characters that we got so we got like 50 cards in a deck i originally it was 104 i had it at two decks of course tom came in and said okay let's streamline this and there's a reason why and we, you know, we have our discussion and stuff. And he was definitely right on that. Of course, experience counts. Um, and it made, it made it easy so we didn't have to make two decks of cards. We could play the game all on one deck of cards. Makes it easy for production. Uh, makes it less complicated for the players. Uh, so that, that worked out well. But that's what's going on there with uh, Chris now and his artwork. It's just good stuff. Uh, but anyway, guys, uh, thank you very much uh, for downloading the game. Please get it to the table. Play it with friends new and veteran alike. Let me know if you have any comments that you'd like to see more of or just an attaboy or any errors that you might see at castlearchon at gmail.com. I welcome it all. And maybe you'd like to play test the next one that comes out because I do want to, after I get done with this one, get done releasing Awakening Yogurt to you all. I do want to make another one. I want to sit back and get it all right the first time. Not... Not just an efficiency, but also a streamlined, just focused beam of light right to Steve Jackson's mind, right? Now, before I make that sound like some kind of conspiracy for UFO lasers and the Illuminati, <laughs> I mean just to write what he wants to see, definitely. Um, and, uh, you know, so I can get right in there without any problems. So anyway, guys, thank you very much. Roll some dice on the table this weekend. You have a good one.